Thanks for having me guys. Hey Nix, hey Nelly, hope you guys have been behaving yourselves. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks Joe for the interview and uh, hopefully we'll learn some stuff today about epilepsy surgery. So I hope you guys are not going to be too cheeky to me today and uh, hopefully it'll be a smooth interview. So we're at the Marta Epilepsy, uh, Advanced Epilepsy Unit. We're a specialist surgical unit dealing with epilepsy surgery. Uh, we, this is our unit right here. What we do here is we're heavily emphasising epilepsy surgery. We offer the stereo EEG, which is a very complex technique of inserting electrodes into the brain mm -hmm. in order to find where the seizures are coming from. Um, and we're one of only two centres in the whole of Australia that does this procedure. Look, our our centre is more designed for high-level epilepsy surgery, for epilepsy surgery in general. Um, and it's a, it's a very important aspect of the whole field of epilepsy and I personally believe it's a separate just because you're an epilepsy centre doesn't mean you're necessarily good at epilepsy surgery or necessarily good at epilepsy genetics for example. Um, so you know different centres have their own speciality. Um, epilepsy surgery particularly is critical because one of the big things is that it is time dependent. So for example frontal lobe epilepsy, epilepsy coming from the frontal lobe, if they don't have any lesion on this, if there's no abnormality on there, Interestingly, if you operate on it within the first five years, you're looking at a 90% outcome. But you take the same epilepsy, and now you leave it for 10, 20 years, your outcome is roughly 40, 30, 40%. So, you know, with the whole field of epilepsy surgery, I think as with most neurology, we know that if you get in there early, and probably would have say all of medicine, to be fair, if you get in there early and intervene quickly, there's more of a chance that patients do better than if you let it go and leave it. And this is a, unfortunately, it's a big problem in our state because epilepsy services are difficult to access, but surgery especially is very difficult to access with historically most patients going into state to have epilepsy surgery done. So we're trying to you know, relieve the burden of that and offer good quality, accurate epilepsy surgery uh, with excellent outcomes. So look, with epilepsy surgery, it's there, there is a kind of this is a basic flow chart. Yeah. Um, so very often, what happens is you have a patient and they got a problem on the MRI, like a lesion, be yeah. it a tumor, an area of scar tissue, etc., etc. And what you do is you bring them in for monitoring. And what you're keen to understand is the behaviour they have during the seizure, mm -hmm. what we call the semiology. What do they do with the seizure? And does it correspond to that area of the brain? And number two, do your brain waves, your EEG signals also corresponds to where that abnormality is on the MRI. If it's yes, then you do further imaging, you know, for example, PET scans, SPECT scans, what we call functional imaging, to see whether or not those area, that area which is abnormal on the MRI is also abnormal with these other modalities. Mm. And if it is, that's great. You know, you send the patient for neuropsychology to test to see is that part of the brain dysfunctional, mm -hmm. where that abnormality is, and you send them to see a neuropsychiatrist, all patients see a neuro neuropsychiatrist, to check do they understand the procedure, can they consent, are they comfortable with undergoing this, or do they not have enough information, and are they, you know, obviously they, they will be apprehensive about the procedure, and do we need to guide them a bit more before we go down the route of surgery. So this is all very carefully planned, and then finally if everything adds up then we can do surgery, however, Within this flowchart, if any one of these is abnormal or doesn't correspond, then you are obliged to do what we call an invasive procedure. Um, now, the invasive procedure, there are two types around the world. The most common still in 2018 is this subdural grid evaluation. Now, this is a procedure whereby you have to open up a large area of the skull and you put electrodes on the surface of the brain. Um, it is a technique that while it's important gives you a lot of information and allows you to proceed with surgery in cases that otherwise would have not been able to undergo surgery, there is a huge morbidity associated with it because you're opening up the skull at risk of meningitis, you're putting electrodes on top of the skull so there's risks of intracranial pressure mm -hmm. and all of these patients have to go to the intensive care unit right. Right, afterwards because it's so, so um, fraught with potential complications. 
On the other hand, you have the Stereo EG, and that's what we specialize in. Now, the Stereo EG is slightly different. We have um, the only robot implantation robot in the Southern Hemisphere. So it uses na laser navigation to identify certain areas of the brain that we're interested in, and then we can accurately implant electrodes into the depths of the brain in order to record seizures arising from those areas. Now, it looks a little bit frightening, as all of these procedures do, but these are very small holes into the skull, and electrodes are just fed through. And because we're using high-level navigation systems, you're avoiding blood vessels, you're avoiding small veins, um, and so therefore, it's in, around the world that this is the safest procedure. Mm. And there's no need for patients to go to the ICU. So once you've inserted electrodes, they wake up in recovery, you get a CT scan done, in order to merge the MRI with the electrodes so you can see where these electrodes are anatomically and then they're sent back up to the ward for immediate recording. And so this is a whole different ball game. It's very well tolerated and because you're not exposing the skull you don't have risks of meningitis and raising to cranial pressure and all those other inherent risks of epilepsy surgery. Unfortunately though, the interpretation of this technique is very complex and requires very specialized training. Hence, that's why there are not many centers around the world at this point in time offering it, but it is becoming more and more common. And I dare say in the next five years, it will absolutely replace the subdural grids um, as a technique. So we're, we're pretty good here in Australia. This is our stereotactic laser uh, navigation robot. Um, it's really enhanced the speed that we can do the SCG. So when we first used a frame, the first case we ever did took about eight hours in the operating room. And it was eight electrodes. These days we can comfortably, comfortably put in about 17 to 19 electrodes in about an hour and a half. Um, so that helps you know, reduce patient time exposure to general anesthesia. It's a quicker procedure, obviously, and we can get down and start recording seizures much more quickly. Um, and also it's very safe in terms of when we pinpoint and we target, the accuracy of this is just incredible. Um, we're out by no more than um, 0.01 millimeters. So it's, it's remarkably, remarkably um, accurate. So yeah, it's the first in the Southern Hemisphere, probably the only one in the Southern Hemisphere at this stage for the Stereo EG. So the Stereo EG helps us to locate where the electrodes are, uh, where, where the seizures are coming from. Mm. Um, but we do also at times use the grid monitor, but in the setting of being in the theater. So we don't use it as a chronic implantation to implant the patient and bring them to the ward. Mm. We use it, for example, if, we, if, the if the Stereo EG has identified the epilepsy coming from an area that's important for speech. And then what we will do is in the operating theater, we'll place the grid on top of the speech area stimulate the different contacts mm -hmm. and figure out where the where the speech sensors are precisely which will allow the surgeon to navigate to remove the area of epilepsy but sparing the speech sensors so that there's no deficit and in fact it's interesting you ask that question because here is that exact case right here wow. so this young gentleman as you can see this is the MRI merge with the electrodes and this electrode here is literally half a centimetre away from his speech centre. And so if you just remove that by itself, he would be at high risk of losing his speech. And the aim of epilepsy surgery is not to cause harm, not to cause deficit. So what we did was a two-stage procedure. We identified his epilepsy using a Stereo EG pinpoint, and then we took him to the operating theatre and we placed this grid on top of his brain. And this grid is over the language area but also over the area that we wanted to remove. And what we were able to do is we were able to, we wake him up, I know it sounds daunting, but there's a lot of preparation that goes in with the patient. So there's a lot of counseling, many weeks of counseling, working with the patient. So we woke him up in the theater um, and we asked him to talk. And Peter Jones, who's our nurse practitioner, was talking to him about Star Wars, his favorite films and all this thing, just to make him comfortable. And bear in mind, he had been prepared for this and there was a lot of, um, familiarization with the procedure before we actually did it and so as he was talking we then stimulated these electrodes and we found very clearly that the speech center located between these two electrodes right here and the lesion itself was just located around here between area six and seven so we were able to inform the surgeon 
um, that this is where the area was and to avoid this region. So the surgeon went in there, moved um, the, this area and the young man is now completely seizure free and without wow. deficit. So that was really, really encouraging. So we do use it, but not as a chronic implantation. If we feel strongly that this is a focal epilepsy, that there is a focus in the brain, then we'll try and do everything to help the patient um, to the point of stereoegic. But unfortunately, there are some people whereby you implant the electrodes and then you find out that that area of the brain is inoperable either because the area involved is way too big to operate on or because the area that the epilepsy is coming from is in an area that may be critical for function. And as I said earlier, we would never do surgery that would harm anyone, okay? That's not the goal of surgery. So if you potentially have a patient whereby operating them would cause them to lose their speech mm -hmm. or become weak in one side, etc., etc., then you'd have to think closely or very carefully about going through that surgery. So there are some patients that are inoperable um, and in those patients, the SCG is still useful. And why is it useful? Because there are certain technologies that are coming here to Australia in the future, such as a repetitive neurostimulator. And that's a device where you put it on the surface of the brain, it records seizures and sends down counter currents. Now, obviously, if you haven't had an SCG or an invasive evaluation, you really don't know where those areas are. So the fact is, if patients have had an SEG and at that point in time we say to them, look, we're really sorry, we can't do surgery, that information may actually make them eligible for these new technologies once they hit the Australian shores. So it's never, it's never a waste and it's never a lost cause. Um, and also there are other things that we identify, such as the deep brain stimulator that we've performed. Mm. So, you know, you are, there are some patients whereby they're not operable at first glance. And as you start to go deeper into the technique and stereo EG, you can actually find other things that may be helpful. And that's when we implanted the first case, I think, in Australia in 2015 with deep brain stimulation, seizure-free.